Oh, I'm back at the Academy Awards. Um, I have, again, the distinct honor of introducing another great friend and somebody who's been a hero to me my entire gift planning career, and that's Craig Ruck. Um, Craig has more than 40 years of experience in charitable gift planning, um, both in the nonprofit and the for-profit settings. He served at, <clears throat> excuse me, the St. Paul Community Foundation, University of Minnesota, uh, U.S. Trust, Caspic and Company, and U.S. Bank. So has experience on both sides of the table in gift planning. He's our past uh, government relations chair for the national and um, is author of Plan Giving in a Nutshell, a really good book to have on your shelf. Um, he has his MBA from the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota, in case you were thinking it was in the Virgin Islands, and also his bachelor's degree in journalism for the University of Utah. Um, one of my favorite people, Mr. Craig Ruck. Speaker recognition. Um, which, which one was yours, Craig? So, um, I don't know. I don't know where she put it. I have it on a drive. Should we go thumb drive? Mm -hmm. So you all enjoy your dessert while we figure this out. go get her to be on the safe side. Okay. All right, Chris, thank you for the gracious um, introduction. I don't deserve it. Um, and thanks to all of you for ignoring while well, we had a momentary technical difficulty, but I think we fixed it. I have PowerPoint slides, and that's, that's really the most important thing. Um, I was interested as I was watching the number of people who came in and got their dessert first. And I was sort of wondering about that, and Steve explained to me, oh, it's all about the line. The line for lunch is too long, so that's why they're doing that. I'm not sure. I don't think that's it at all. I think they were worried they were going to run out of dessert. Um, let me begin a little off script and say congratulations to all of you for your Leave a Legacy program. Um, it is just amazing the work you've done in this community. That was a program that was very near and dear to my heart. Um, such a simple idea that we can use our estate plans to leave behind a message about the things that are important to us. But you really here have, have lived that legacy. I think Leave a Legacy is also important for another reason right now. Leave a Legacy is really all about believing in the future. And as you know, um, our organizations really have to believe in the future if, we're, if they're going to have planned giving programs. We have to believe in the future if we're going to talk to donors about these sorts of things. And our donors really need to believe in the future if they're going to make legacy gifts. So Leave a Legacy also is about believing in the future, which is something that I think is very important right now. 
um, given, given the state of our world. So congratulations to you and give a round of applause to everybody who's been involved in Leave a Legacy. <clears throat> So my task today is to talk to you about philanthropy in the time of Trump. And I must tell you, I agreed to do this quite a long while ago and started working on the slides and kept updating them. <laughs> I actually subscribed to Donald Trump's Twitter feed. It's my morning. I used to read the, the comic pages back when there were newspapers, but now it's the, it's the Trump feed and it changes all the time. So even now, some of my, some of my slides are out of date. As Chris said, I had the opportunity to serve as government relations chair for the National Committee on Planned Giving a number of years ago. That was a, an enormous um, gift to me. It was like a dream come true. I had always planned to retire early and become a high school civics teacher. I am now too old to retire early and I still have not taught high school civics. The other thing they didn't know when they gave me that honor is for me, politics is like sports. I'm really not much of a sports fan. I understand you have a hockey team here in Detroit, and some, but that's all a mystery to me. But C-SPAN on a Saturday morning when there's a special session of Congress, that's living for me. I really do enjoy the politics of it. And the other thing I had the opportunity to learn is a lot of new jokes because the things these people do are really just hilarious and we all need to, we all need to keep a sense of humor about it. What I want to do today is do about five things in the time we have together. I want to spend a little bit of time going through some statistics. I think we can learn from past. I really don't believe in a world of, of alt facts. So we'll take a look at about 40 years of data and see how charitable giving has been affected by political change in our country. And one of the arguments I'm going to make is um, it doesn't affect charitable giving all that much. We're actually much more susceptible to some other things. I will take just a brief moment, if you're willing after that, to give you a little bit of a civics lesson, because it's important to understand how the legislature works and, and what a reconciliation bill is and why everybody's upset about a filibuster. I won't take too long, but that's me living out my dream to be a, to be a civics teacher. And then I want to spend um, some time talking about the issues that I see on the horizon. Some of, them, some of them are here today, but the issues particularly for charitable giving which will lead us into a brief presentation about a Congressional Budget Office study that is actually six years old now. Don't worry about it. They stay on the shelf forever until somebody needs them. And this CBO study is really an outright attack on the uh, charitable deduction. And I think it's important that we dust that off and take a look at it. It is starting to have some currency so that we don't all wind up totally depressed after bowls and bowls full of um, sugar and strawberries and whipped cream, I'll try to end up with some thoughts about where we might go, because I actually think this is a very exciting time. It's a time of change, but it's also a time of, of great opportunity. So if that sounds good to you, um, that will be the agenda for the next hour or so. I did provide you copies of all of the slides as well as copies of that CBO study that I find so frightening, as well as a copy of an Urban Institute study of the CBO study, because what would a congressional study be if you didn't have a think tank study disproving much of which is what is in the Congressional Budget Office study. So you have all of those materials. I would like to um, have some questions and dialogue, so I'll try to stop it at several points and see what questions you might have. So let's dive into some data. Um, this, is, this, is, uh, this is the way I feel, maybe most days, and it would be even better if I could show you um, the driver of the car with his foot flat on the floor and the bridge is out. Um, there, are, uh, I don't know, I, don't, I can't predict the kind of world that we're, that we're moving toward, but we do know what the past looked like. So this first graph, um, these are 40 years of data charitable giving in the United States. Interesting, um, interesting note, we don't have a really good measure of total charitable giving in the United States. There's nowhere, there's no meter point, there's no gate where you can measure charitable giving. So the best data we have are uh, data from the survey Giving USA. It's been done for 50 odd years now. There are 40 years of data on this graph. 
but it's a reliable, um, method of, it's a reliable methodology and collected consistently year after year. So these are the best guesses we have of charitable giving in the United States. I'll show you first, this is individual giving. And I used inflation adjusted numbers, so that's, that's not what you're seeing. What you're seeing is an increase of about 2% per year, year in and year out for the last 40 years. Pretty steep climb right there in the 90s, but otherwise sort of ups and downs and, and not much change. <clears throat> we could layer on top of that um, charitable bequest giving, which of course comes from individuals. And that band remains relatively consistent as well. It's a little thinner 40 years ago and a little thicker as we move, as we move out toward current times. I would like to think that that increasing band of charitable bequests is because of the work that we've all been doing. That's roughly the span of my career. So when I meet for my performance evaluation, I show this graph to my boss and say, see, this is what we've been able to do. This is why we invest in plan giving programs. The next layer would be corporate giving. <coughs> corporate giving adjusted, adjusted for inflation has actually been declining a bit um, over the last 40 years. And then the last band is foundation giving. So foundation giving, as you can see, that band is getting thicker relatively quickly. But I would suggest to you there are a couple of reasons for that. First of all, we need to remember all foundation money, almost all foundation money, came from individuals. So it's really kind of a measure of individual giving anyway. Those are gifts that may have been made to a private foundation and then uh, distributed as charitable contributions. And remember, the advent of donor-advised funds. So donor-advised funds in this survey show up as, distributions from donor-advised funds show up as current charitable giving, but they are in fact gifts from individuals. So very interesting. It's a pretty healthy economy. It's been growing, as I said, about 2% per year adjusted for inflation, year in and year out, ups and downs. So then I wondered, how does politics affect this? Well, you can layer over that the various administrations, um, from Carter through Obama. And what you can see from that, if you look sort of behind, be, behind the colored bars, what you can see from that is not much. I mean, sometimes it goes up a little more steeply under democratic regimes, but other times it rises just as steeply under Republican administrations. So I would suggest there really isn't a strong correlation. The steepest climb is during Clinton administration, but that was the time of the tech boom. That was a booming economy. We could look at, uh, you'll see the white numbers across the bottom, we could look at recessions. So I tried to chart out the major recessions. And here, if you look up from those white numbers, here's where you do see a little bit of correlation. So it seems like when the economy is healthy, charitable giving increases more steeply than when we're in a time of recession. In fact, I would argue if you look straight up from the white numbers, recessions do tend to flatten out charitable giving a little bit. It takes a t some time to recover from that. The big one, um, in 07 through 09, really caused a dramatic drop. If you look at just those eight years of the, or seven years I have of the Obama administration, that's a steep climb, but it was recovering from a pretty dramatic drop. So I'm not sure that we can argue from these data that there is an impact of who's in the White House, that there's a correlation with charitable giving. Um, here's another set of data. This is charitable giving as a percent of in the first instance, um, disposable personal income. Same 40-year period, 1975 through 2015. Up and down, um, certainly that period of the tech boom, again, that was a big boost. People gave more of their disposable personal income during that period, but it leveled out. And it really hasn't varied much around 2%. We could look at charitable giving as a percent of gross domestic product. So the entire economy is represented by that gold line. It parallels um, contributions as a, as a percent of disposable personal income. Here's an interesting one, though, the la and I promise this is the last line I'm going I'm to layer on here. Um, this is charitable giving as a percent of corporate profits. So this is interesting to think about. Corporate profits, there was a real spike in the 80s. 
and then it dropped precipitously. Another spike, again, around the tech boom. That was a great time to be a fundraiser. But then dropped again, and corporate giving as a percent of profits hovers around 1%. We don't seem to be able to move it. Then layer on once again the um, presidential administrations. And again, I would defy you to draw real correlations. It doesn't seem to matter whether there's a Republican in the White House or a Democrat in the White House. That doesn't seem to affect charitable giving. So then, and you can imagine what rainy nights are like at our house. This is, this is what I do. <laughs> so then I looked at, I decided to dive deeper and look at four specific recessions that are historic and well documented. So it's a recession of 73, 75. Well, I'm not going to ask. I was going to ask how many were alive for that. It, uh, that would only hurt my feelings. The recession of 80, 83, 90, 92, and then the really steep recession, steep but short recession following 9-1-1. And uh, this, is the, uh, this is the standard and poor's index, so this is the stock market. And here's what happened during each of those periods, and this is, this is the change. So the stock market took a dive and came back during that recession. In each recession it did, interestingly enough, it almost always came back. Usually we think, well, if the stock market's up, then people give more because they feel like they have more money. So here's a look at total giving. No correlation whatsoever. Sometimes the stock market tanks as it did in 80, 83, and charitable giving actually increased a little bit. Um, other times, I don't know what happened after 9-11, but charitable giving dropped probably because everybody was nervous for about a year or so, but then it, then it rebounded faster than the stock market. So we need to think about what that means. We always think that a good stock market is good for charitable giving. I'm not sure. One last line and then I promise we're done with the graphs. Here is gross domestic product. So that's total change, change in the total economy. And look at the correlation between those numbers. So I would take all of these slides and I would suggest to you the most important correlation for charitable giving is a healthy and growing economy. A robust economy feeds charitable giving. I don't think it really matters who's in control in the White House, what sort of testimony is going to happen tomorrow. None of that really seems to matter for charitable giving. Let me pause there for just a minute and see, are there any questions that come to mind right away? I promise, no more graphs, so you, 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 can, you, you needn't be fearful. Okay, well if there aren't, let's, uh, let's start the civics lesson. I'm going to see if I can do this in three minutes or less. The United States Congress, everybody says, oh yes, I know what that is, and then they're immediately confused about the difference among the Congress, the Senate, the House of Representatives, and why do I have a congressman if he's actually a member of the House of Representatives. Here's how it works. The Senate is 100 seats. There are two for each state. Um, they have six-year terms, and they are staggered so that about one-third of them are standing for election every two years. So the Senate's relatively slow to turn over. Um, it is broadly representative of the states. All states have two. It doesn't matter how many people live in that state. The United States, how, or I'm sorry, um, important to know, 52 Republicans, 46 Democrats, and two independents right now. So the Republicans have a majority in the Senate, but it's a slim majority. It's really not very big at all. The two independents generally caucus with the Democrats. The House of Representatives, 435 seats. Those seats are apportioned based on population. Um, currently, it's about 710,000 people per congressional district. But no state can have less than one. So we have states like Montana, which has two senators and one congressman. Um, all, of, all, all representatives, all congressmen, stand for re-election every two years. So at least theoretically, we could have an entirely new House of Representatives every two years but it would take us six full years to get rid of all of the United States Senators if we wanted to vote them out of office. Um, this is out of date. There are now 239 Republicans. There are only three vacancies. You may have followed two weeks ago. In Montana, we proved that you can actually be indicted for assaulting a reporter and win the election the next day, which is exactly what happened in, 
in Montana. So 239 Republicans, 193 Democrats, and four vacancies. The important point here is although the Republicans clearly control the House of Representatives, it's only about a 55 percent majority. It is not overwhelming. Here's why all of that is important. The majority party appoints the committees and the chairs. So all of the chairs of all of the legislative committees are Republicans now. And the committees generally, the committees generally reflect the balance. So you will find in most Senate committees, if it's a committee of ten, you will find six Republicans and four Democrats. So there's a relative balance among the committee membership, but the committee chairs control the committee agenda. They literally have the power of God to decide what gets considered and what doesn't. Um, if they're not interested in a bill, it will not come before their committee. And those committee seats, as I said, are awarded proportionately, but the majority party gets to control who goes to which committee, and some committees are more important than others. So that's the United States Congress. Um, remember that a Congress runs for two years. So we are now in the 115th Congress. It started in January of this year. It will end at the end of 2018. A Congress runs for two years, which to us is very important because in order to make a law, all of these things need to happen. It needs to get introduced, and it needs to get introduced in each chamber, both the House and the Senate. It will then be referred to a committee for study and referral and so on and so forth. The committee chairs are all powerful. The committee chairs will then decide when it comes forward. It needs to pass in identical form in both chambers. So it finally gets out of committee, it gets passed by the House, maybe the Senate does the same thing. Now we have two bills, but they're not exactly identical. So we will go into a conference committee to try to resolve that. Both chambers have to pass the law in identical language. Then it gets sent to the president. The president can veto it. If the president vetoes it, the legislature might override that veto. But it does not become a law until it's passed that way. And all of that has to happen within the two years of a Congress. So come December of 2018, whatever might be before the 115th Congress dies. It has to be reintroduced again. This is why it took us so many, many years to pass the IRA rollover legislation. We kept having to reset the counter and start over again. Um, two terms that you'll hear a lot this, uh, this Congress, filibuster. Filibuster is actually a Senate rule. It's very simple. It simply says we can continue to debate forever until 60 senators agree that it's time to vote. So that's what a filibuster means. The vote is actually a vote to invoke cloture. So if you want to stop something in the Senate, what you do is you just debate forever. And until you have 60 votes to stop the debate, nothing happens. You will also hear about reconciliation. A reconciliation bill is a Senate rule that applies only to a budget bill. So if the Senate declares that a bill is a reconciliation bill, what that means is they can go straight to a vote without invoking cloture. But it has to be a budget bill. So the game that gets played is, how many things can we hang on this budget bill so that we can pass it with only 51 votes? Um, here's, here's the outlook, I think, for the 115th Congress. And remember, we're talking now about 2017 to 2018. I think the Republicans are really stymied and really frustrated. Um, they are not sure what's going to happen next from their administration. The executive branch is, is their party, um, but they're, not, uh, they're, they're fearful to take a step for fear that it will be reversed in tomorrow's twit tweet storm. The Democrats are mobilizing, but the Democrats are being Democrats. They're very chaotic and confused, and they have a hard time sort of um, excluding anybody's point of view or coming up with a majority point of view. I think the um, GOP legislative agenda, therefore, is totally stalled by the administration. The only thing that has passed so far is the appointment of a Supreme Court justice, and as you know, they had to go nuclear to do that. They had to break with 200 years of tradition. The House and Senate are working on a fiscal year 17 budget. They kind of have to. That's sort of, that's sort of job one on their job description. And they want to pass that using reconciliation. So one of the things to watch for over this summer is the things that get added to that budget bill. Because if you want to push it through the Senate, 
without risking a filibuster, if you can make it part of the budget bill, if you can make some argument to make it part of the budget bill, then chances are this fall it will pass with reconciliation. The Republicans crave major tax reform. The problem that they're having is that they made this promise that it would happen within the first hundred days, and they got nothing right now. Um, the GOP leadership seems to be waiting to hear the details from the president, and I will cover in a minute his plan, which was released in April and was two sides of one sheet of paper, hardly a, hardly a tax bill. And the Republicans know they need consensus. They need 51 votes in the Senate to pass tax reform. So I think they will probably insert language about tax reform. Here's what we think tax reform might look like. And they'll try to, try to push that into the 2018 budget resolution. That resolution actually gets passed um, over the course of this summer, and it sets the tone for how the budget will be resolved um, next year. So here's the Trump tax plan. Did you all read it? it? It won't take you but three minutes to read it. It really is two sides of one sheet of paper. It is bullet points only. Um, and it has not progressed since April. So it's a two-page summary. Um, it promises tax simplification, right? Who could be against that? Tax simplification and tax reductions. You're going to make it simpler, you're going to pay less. What does that begin to sound like? Um, here's the quote, and, and by the way, it has a catchy name, the Tax Reform for Economic Growth and American Jobs, colon, this is the title of the bill, the biggest individual and business tax cut in American history. So it's audacious, it has, it has aspirations. Um, it would have three individual tax brackets, 10%, 25%, and 35%. So the 39.6% bracket would go away and we would lose the, the middle bracket. So just three individual income tax brackets. It would double the standard deduction to $24,000 per year. So right now, as you know, about three out of four Americans claim the standard deduction and therefore don't get any value from the charitable deduction. That number would substantially increase with the $24,000 standard deduction. It would repeal the estate tax, the alternative minimum tax, and the dreaded Obamacare tax. That's the Medicare surcharge tax on high-income individuals, um, and co cap corporate tax rates at 15 percent. So this is, this is the Trump tax plan. As I said, it is nowhere near becoming a tax bill yet, but it does set the framework, and, and at least as of about an hour ago, the President has not tweeted anything that would suggest that he, is, that he has changed his mind about any of these things. So let's um, take a look at one of the most important committees for our purposes, and that's the Ways and Means Committee. Ways and Means is a very important committee. Um, it has jurisdiction over an amazing array of things. It's got taxes, it's got health care, Social Security, Medicare, international trade, and welfare. So it's all there in the House Ways and Means Committee. Um, the chair is a man named Kevin Brady. He's a Republican from Texas. Here's what Congressman Brady looks like. You can see. Somebody told him this is a portrait, you're going to have to smile now, Congressman Brady, and he, he really worked at being able to put a smile on his face there. Congressman Brady is really kind of a hapless individual. He was first elected in 1996. It was a contested election. It wound up being a court decision, and he's been opposed in every primary since. Usually the party that has control of that district doesn't oppose, but he's had opposition in every primary since then. Um, in 2015, sort of a stroke from heaven, he was suddenly swept into the office of the chair of the House Ways and Means Committee. Paul Ryan, who you may know, moved on to become the Speaker of the House, and that made a vacancy, and Kevin Brady, lo and behold, was elected by his party to be chair of the House Ways and Means Committee. Um, Brady is on record. He favors lower taxes, deficit reduction, and free trade, and he's a big proponent of replacing the income tax with a national sales tax. That's been part of his, that's been part of his, uh, his pitch since, since that contested election back in 1996. You can see it if you go to his home page. Right on his home page, he has an example. This is what the tax form would look like if Congressman Brady had his way. Um, there is some good news for us. As you can see, it's a very simple, you just, this is one of those, tell us what you earned and then pay a percentage of it, but he does allow for a charitable deduction. So that's kind of good news. Congressman Brady, at least, is not opposed to the charitable deduction. So we will have to watch. Remember that budget bills 
originate in the House, which means they originate in the Ways and Means Committee. Questions about that? And uh, thus endeth the, the civics lesson. No? Did I, I think I took a little more than three minutes. Sorry about that. So let's talk about the tax policy issues that are going to face us in philanthropy. Um, and I think there are several. I think there will be tax reform of some sort. I doubt that we're going to scrap the tax code, as some people say. But I think we will see at least a, a nod toward tax reform. The question is, how extensive is it going to be? Um, certainly limiting it to three, three brackets um, would be major. But the real question is, is it going to happen in 17 or 18? And as each day goes by, I'm thinking it's going to happen toward the end of this Congress. Now, that itself is not unusual. Oftentimes, the controversial things are held because everybody wants to make nice for the first year of the Congress. And then the second year of the Congress, everybody is running for re-election, so they need real issues. So that wouldn't be that unusual. But I think we will see some sort of tax reform. Um, the question is, this year or next year, and how extensive? I think there is a growing uncertain consensus about the charitable deduction. And I'll say more about that in a minute. But there are questions about the fairness of the charitable deduction. The public is becoming aware that three quarters of the American public does not itemize and therefore cannot take advantage of the charitable deduction. So there are questions about, is it fair at all? And uh, I will show you in the Congressional Budget Office report, there are questions about the effectiveness of the charitable de deduction. Does it actually um, encourage and increase charitable giving? I think we have to be more concerned than we are currently about abuses and about the normalization of abuses of tax-exempt status. And as an example, I think about the way the Clinton and Trump foundations were treated during the campaign. Now, it became a campaign issue, and you know, campaign is great theater and all that, and certainly entertaining for me, but one of the consequences is it has become normal now to think of philanthropic foundations as somehow shell organizations, you know, a bit shady. I mean, what would you expect? Because after all, I heard about that foundation that paid cash for an eight-foot tall um, oil painting of the founder, which he then hung in his own private club. And that's the sort of thing, you know, that foundations. So I worry that that, that, that attitude is taking root out there. And that once it becomes normal, once everybody assumes that tax-exempt status is somehow shady or tricky, um, it's going to be very difficult to, to earn that respect back. I also am fearful that there is a new logic to tax code spending. Does everybody know what I mean by tax code spending? So the idea behind tax code spending is if we, through various provisions in the tax code, like the charitable deduction, if we allow people to avoid paying taxes on a portion of their income, that is actually an expenditure of federal revenue. We could have taxed it but we decided not to. Therefore, we expended federal revenue because we decided to forego money we could have collected. And if that is an expenditure of revenue, then it ought to be budgeted for. Then we ought to figure out how we're spending that revenue. So this notion of tax code spending um, is going to become a powerful way for Congress to increase taxes, to increase revenue, I'm sorry, without increasing taxes. Because what they will say is the tax rate stayed the same. We didn't increase taxes. What are you talking about? The rate's the same as it always was. We just eliminated several deductions or increased the floor on those deductions. That caused billions of dollars to flow into the Treasury, but we didn't increase anybody's taxes. So tax code spending is a real thing, and it's particularly aimed at the charitable deduction. Um, and then I worry about nonprofit reform as a trifecta for someone, oh, maybe Congressman Brady. He's had, a, he's had a primary challenge every time. And the trifecta is this. If you think that nonprofits are well-intentioned but sort of simplistic organizations that really need our help to become very efficient, and if you think that people who use things like the charitable deduction might be chiseling on their taxes anyway, and if you're running for office and your objective is to increase federal revenue, reforming nonprofits, nonprofit reform could be a trifecta. You help those nonprofits that are terribly inefficient anyway. I mean, they're not businesses, right? If they were, if they were worth their salt, they'd be businesses. So you help, you help the nonprofits, you catch the tax cheaters, and you raise more revenue. 
If you're running for election, what's not to like about that? And um, you only affect one out of four registered voters. So I think those are the issues facing us. Um, I think it's important, and we're going to transition now to talk about our tradition of charitable giving. I think it's important for us to all remember the long history of the charitable deduction. Not just tax incentives for charitable giving, but the charitable deduction. So the income tax started in 20, or 1913. Um, that's when the income tax was enacted. Just four years later, we had the first charitable deduction. Why did we create that charitable deduction? We created it because that was at a time when we were increasing federal income tax rates to pay for World War I. We had this novel notion that you ought to pay for wars as you have them, not just charge them and increase the deficit. So they actually increased tax rates to pay for World War I, but they were very concerned that as the federal tax burden increased on individuals, those individuals would curtail their charitable giving. So the idea really was to protect charitable giving. It was limited. It was only 15% of taxable income. That went along for quite a long while. In 1924, we added a 100% deduction. You could actually deduct 100% of your taxable income. You could zero out your, um, your federal income tax. You had to give 90% or more of your taxable income to do that, but it was really quite a provision. Um, that lasted for only a few years. In 1969, we had the big change, the Tax Act of 1969. That gave us the limits that we're all familiar with now. So you can deduct up to 50% of your adjusted gross income for gifts of cash, 30% limit for gifts of appreciated property. Um, and those limits replace the original 1917 and 1924 limits. That's the way it's been since 1969. Some of you will remember in 81 and 85, we experimented for just a period of years um, a limited deduction for non-itemizers. Um, it had strict limits around it. It didn't make much of a difference in charitable giving, and it had a sunset provision, so we lost that. So don't let anybody tell you that the charitable deduction is something new or novel. It's been a part of our federal income tax system almost since the beginning, and I'm one. I get it. I understand that the philanthropic motive is the primary thing. It's the most important thing. But I also know there are dozens, hundreds of conversations I would never have been invited into had it not been for my ability to talk to someone about the opportunity to save some income taxes while they were doing charitable work. Um, there, there is good evidence, I think, and this is broad brush, this next slide, there is good evidence about the effectiveness of the charitable deduction. Just to cherry pick a few facts, 27% of households roughly itemize. So about three out of four people take the standard deduction. 27% of households itemize. Those itemizers, itemizers make two-thirds of the charitable contributions. So one in four is making two-thirds of the charitable contributions. Um, overall, those who claim a charitable deduction give nearly twice the percent of income as those who don't. Um, and then for those with incomes over $100,000, they actually give about three times as much as the rest of the population. So it seems like, we're looking for direction here, it seems like there's good sense to the charitable deduction. It seems to motivate people. There are some political realities that attach to all those facts that I just read for you. 73% of taxpayers do not itemize. What does that mean? That means that if I'm going to run for re-election and I have opposed the charitable deduction, I have been in favor of reducing the charitable deduction, I'm, going, I'm only going to affect one out of four of the people who might vote for me. Now, it's true, those one out of four are probably my campaign contributors, but I'm not going to affect the vast majority of people who might vote for me. Yes, sir? Yes. Yeah. No, it doesn't. Let me repeat so everybody can hear. The, the um, IRS, if you go to irs.gov, it should be, you should have it bookmarked. It's a terrific website, and I don't mean that, I really don't mean that the least bit facetiously. Some of their training material is incredible. But if you go there, you will find the statistics of income file, the SOI file, and it's updated periodically. It's this massive database. They comb all of the, all of the federal tax returns. And the observation is that for households with 
adjusted gross income is over $200,000, about 95% of them itemize. So yes, it is true. That, I think, goes, though, to the, um, the elitist argument. So it's those rich people. That's who you're trying to protect. And if I'm running for re-election, every vote counts just once, as far as we know. Um, so it, as, a, as someone, run, as an elected official running for office, I want to be careful that I'm not painted as being an elitist. 95% um, of the, or 94 percent of those with incomes over $100,000 do itemize. Um, 90, so it gets to 95 percent at 200,000. 91 percent of those with incomes less than $30,000 do not itemize. This is not too surprising because you can practically zero out your income with just the standard deduction. And, as we'll see in a minute, itemizers support different clauses than the majority of taxpayers. So I'll show you a couple of pie charts in just a minute that, um, that really ought to strike, strike fear in your heart. Any other questions or observations before we go? Okay. May 24th, 2011. Um, if you didn't hear it, you should have. The Congressional Budget Office dropped this thing then. It was a report that was done at the request of the Congress. It considers various options for changes to the tax treatment of charitable giving. Um, this is in the materials that, you, that are available to you. Um, it's, a, it's a thick read, but it's really well worth it. Um, if you dig in there, you will find that the charitable deduction is referred to as a tax subsidy not an incentive for charitable giving, a tax subsidy, a subsidy for charitable giving, a tax subsidy that costs the Treasury nearly $46 billion per year um, and is not equitable. It does not treat all taxpayers equitably. It says that, the CBO study says that, this tax subsidy subsidizes wealthy taxpayers more than others and it subsidizes charitable giving to some organizations, those organizations chosen by the wealthy, more than others. So it really paints the picture that the charitable deduction is at its root unfair and costs the Treasury $46 billion a year. The graphs that you will find, and I'll run through these in both directions, these graphs are fascinating to me. This is a pie chart <coughs> that shows um, the percentage giving to various causes. And the data are stratified by income levels. So for those with AGIs, adjusted gross incomes, under $100,000, here's how the pie breaks down. This is most Americans, most Americans under $100,000. About two-thirds of that giving is for religious causes. For those of us who are in education, 3%. These are not our big donors. Um, the arts, a tiny sliver, 1%. A good share of giving to um, social service and combined appeal, but most of the giving for most Americans is to religious causes. Now look at the, how the pie changes for AGIs between 100,000 and 200,000. So these are people still of pretty modest means. Um, religion is still around 60%, a little less. There has been some growth in some of the other sectors, but the really big changes occur here when you get to 200,000 to a million. Suddenly religion has become less than one quarter. Education is 32%. These are my prospects. And the other sectors have grown. And then with AGIs over a million dollars, it's a stunningly different chart. So just absorb that for a minute. This is the 1%, people with adjusted gross incomes over a million dollars. Here's how they give. 200,000 to 1 million, 100,000 to 200,000, and most Americans. So I think we need to be cognizant of this. This is a Congressional Budget Office report. Um, these are what the data show. Questions about that? There's, uh, wow. <laughs> There's murmuring. It could be about the strawberry shortcake. I'm not sure. Yes. Um, I'm not, the question is, is there any variance by region of the country? And I don't believe the CBO report dug into that. 
Um, there would be a lot more work to do. I am going to give you just a peek at the Urban Institute study, which did look at further stratification, but I don't think CBO did. Yes? So these Yes, correct. This is total charitable giving. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I believe the question is: is is there are, are there similar pie charts with the numbers of donors? Um, I don't think that I don't. I think there is a data table in the study that shows that, but I don't think it was reduced to a chart. And the numbers would be astronomical because the number of people with AGIs under hundred thousand dollars is the vast majority of Americans. So it it would be really really skewed. Other questions or comments? So it only gets worse, I hate to tell you. Um, <laughs> the CBO report actually has several proposals. And keep in mind, this is six years ago, but these things don't go away. It's been sitting on the shelf waiting for some congressman, perhaps who is in a tight district or facing a primary, um, to, to drag it off the shelf. It says, it suggests, one of the things it suggests is let's retain the deduction, don't mess with it, but let's establish a floor. So you would be able to deduct only when your total charitable contributions exceed 2% of your adjusted gross income, for example. And they go through several iterations of that. Um, we could allow all taxpayers to claim the deduction with or without a floor. That would get over the argument that it favors wealthy people over, over other people. That one turns out to be pretty expensive, though. Um, we could replace the deduction with a credit. I actually like this idea. It's a direct credit against your federal taxes. And I like it because it's an easy thing to explain to donors. You choose. Want to pay the federal government? Would you like to support charitable giving? That has some appeal to it. Um, all of these options are projected to reduce charitable giving. So coming right out of the gate, the Congressional Budget Office acknowledges these options would reduce charitable giving, but, they say, the reduction in charitable giving would be less than the reduction in the subsidy for charitable giving. In other words, good deal for the federal government. If the CBO believes that we were spending $46 billion a year to subsidize charitable giving and they make changes that only reduce charitable giving by $40 billion, that's a net savings for the federal government. So that's the logic that's in the CBO report. Um, the Urban Institute study, so this is a think, think tank study talking about the CBO report. The Urban Institute study looked at several of the options from the CBO report. And in every case, that second row from the bottom, in every case there would be an increase in federal revenue and a decrease in charitable giving, even the most optimistic projections. The interesting thing for me when you get time to study it is to look at the changes stratified by income. So the, refund the refundable credit would actually cost us in the top quintile. We would lose our largest donors. They would cease to give. So when you get time, I would really urge you to dig into the Urban Institute study because it's going to be an effective counter to some of the arguments, some of the concerns that the CBO report raises. Let me stop there and see, yes. Right. Right, and that's exactly the argument. <clears throat> the argument has always been charities are more efficient at delivering these services than government entities are, and we need the charitable sector to do that work. And so if the charitable sector goes away, then the federal government is going to have to do the work that the charitable sector used to do much more efficiently. Um, I have several concerns about that. One is, much as we all believe that, we can't really prove it. There is not data, there are not data that show that the charitable sector is more efficient than the government sector. The other thing I worry about, and I don't mean this as a partisan remark necessarily, there are a fair number of people who wouldn't care, who would say, well, that's tough. You know, if you make help hard to get, then the helpless will help themselves. I mean, that is a, that is a line of reasoning that's, that's out there. So I think we have to be very careful about that argument. We can't prove it, first of all. And there's some folks who just don't care. They think if you're in dire straits, it's some fault of your own. 
Good point. Other? Yes. Yeah, if I was forced, gun to my head, choose one of these four, that's the one I would choose. <laughs> sure, okay, you can save some federal revenue, that's fine with me, and it doesn't hurt us as much as some of the others. Yeah, that would be a, that would be a good compromise. Keep in mind, these are, these are academic exercises at this point. None of these is a bill or a proposal yet, but they, they, will, they will inform the, uh, the law writers. Other questions? So what do we do? This is an actual <laughs> photograph. I'm pretty sure it was the kids from the high school that did this. I don't think it was actually the state highway workers, but um, yeah, I mean, that's the danger. The danger is you get overwhelmed by this. So you read that CBO report, and it's like, oh my god, I, there's no point in going into work tomorrow. I'm just, I'm not, I'm not getting out of bed. But I think we have to. Um, I think we have to, and I think what we've got to do is we've got to start getting much, much, much better at making the case for the charitable deduction. And, we, and it's got to become just part of our ordinary talk with our donors, with our boards, with our staff members, with the guy who lives next door. Here's the case for the charitable deduction. It is politically difficult to defend the charitable deduction. Let's not deny that. Deductions do benefit wealthy people. It's true. If you can reduce your taxable income and you got a lot more taxable income than I do and you're in a higher bracket than I am, you get more benefit from a deduction than I do. So we need to dismiss that with kind of a duh. You know, that's what deductions do. That's what they're supposed to do. Taxpayers, this is an argument, taxpayers will react to changes in tax law by adjusting their behavior. If my tax bill goes up, if it becomes more expensive, I will adjust my behavior. I will take account of that additional cost. And charitable giving is totally voluntary. I'm not going to lose a thing if I decrease my charitable giving. So if my tax bill goes up, I'm probably going to adjust my charitable giving to take account of that. And here's the argument. So tax law changes that reduce the incentives for charitable giving are not going to affect the taxpayers. They're not going to affect the wealthy. They will adjust. Reductions in the incentives for charitable giving will affect those who are benefited from the services of charitable organizations. That's the key argument. So don't, this is not about protecting the wealthy. This is about protecting the individuals who benefit from the services of charitable organizations. And that's two and a half tweets, so it's not going to get any traction because you can't get it in between Donald's tweets, which are coming, you know, about every three minutes now. But that's the case we have to make. The other case that I think is embedded there is, if you think back to those pie charts, so the ultra-wealthy don't support religion very much, but they support museums and arts organizations and all of those institutions that the people in the bottom end enjoy and get the use of are supported by very wealthy people. Which means that, and I don't think this is too much of a stretch, it means that the people under $100,000 have the opportunity to support religious causes which are very important to them and still benefit from that art museum, that theater company, that educational institution. So in a way, letting the wealthy choose their own charities actually benefits everybody and gives more freedom to people in the lower economic levels. So those are the arguments that we have to make to support the, the charitable deduction. I think there are reasons to be optimistic, and you can tell me afterwards that I'm being very Pollyanna about this. I don't think so. Um, donors are plentiful. I, don't, I have no lack of people to talk to, and they are generous. One of my continuing concerns when I get in a deep rela planned giving relationship with the donor is, are you sure you can afford to make a gift quite that big? I mean, people really are irrationally generous. Donors are willing to consider unusual gifts. I was talking to a couple of people at the break. You know, the days when you would just get a check seem to be long gone. Donors are interested in having conversations about, well, if I give you this much cash now and I've got this stock that has finally recovered in value from the crash of 09, I could think about that and then maybe we could, donors are having these conversations with us. So donors are engaged. 
Tax changes always provide us an opportunity to talk to people. So if there is a reduction in the number of brackets, here's an opportunity to reinvent those conversations with donors. Um, and then there is, for better or for worse, there is a new attitude of community. There is an attitude in this country that um, we are watching out for others. Some of it is pretty corrosive, but there is a greater understanding, I think, that we are all part of one planet, one community. Some of it, as I said, is headed off in a, in a pretty isolationist direction, but it's there, it's front and center. I think there are four things that nonprofits must do, and I'm, I'm uh, giving full credit here. Nonprofit Quarterly, um, if you don't take a look at their website, it's a quarterly magazine, really good source of policy issues for nonprofits. Nonprofit Quarterly published this actually the day after the election. So they had had a lot of caffeine and uh, put this list together, but I think, it's, I think it's really important. Four things that nonprofits must do. One is we have to go back to our vision. We have to understand that our vision is about communities and the nation and the world that we all want. That's what nonprofits exist to do. We have an obligation to engage our constituents. We have to keep them informed and ready. Um, they are being flooded with all sorts of information, including the tweets from the White House each morning. We have an obligation to be in front of them and talk to them about charitable giving, about our mission, about why our community and our nation are so important. We have to create ways to collaborate. So this morning, speaker, you heard about this too. We have to figure out ways to work with one another. Does our community actually need three nonprofits doing all the same work? Well, each of those three boards of directors would tell you, yes, absolutely, we are unique. But maybe we need to find a way to merge our efforts and to realize that what we're about is advancing health, prosperity, voices that aren't so often heard. And maybe the best way to do that is by collaborating, not creating separate organizations. And then, and this one I think is going to be hard for some nonprofits, we have to advocate. There is no prohibition on nonprofits lobbying. There are strict limits, but there is no prohibition. Nonprofits have an absolute right, in fact, I would argue an obligation, to educate people about issues. Where you will get in trouble is if you start taking a position for or against a specific candidate for office. So don't do that. But as a nonprofit, there's nothing wrong with you taking a position on. Let's say that there is a tax bill and it does not include, it includes a reduction or elimination of the charitable deduction. Take a position on that. Educate, advocate. I would suggest to you that what comes next is we need to, we really need to prepare to fight for the charitable deduction. And then as I, as I wrote that, I decided, no, it's not, it's bigger than that. Um, it's not fight for the charitable deduction. It's fight for tax incentives to encourage charitable giving. There are other ideas that are popping up everywhere. California, where I am now from, the state legislature is considering a bill that would require all charitable remainder trusts with a situs in the state of California to have a minimum deduction remainder of 40%, or the trust would not be qualified under California law. Now, everybody in this room understands why that's quite a hurdle. But from the legislature's perspective, I know the legislator who has introduced that legislation. It's all about why are you trying to benefit the, the 1%? Why, why are you trying to be nice to those wealthy people? I care too, but this isn't going to hurt them that much. So it's about fighting for incentives to encourage charitable giving. I think we have to talk to our donors about these issues. You know, we, let me put it this way, our donors understand where babies come from. So we don't need to hide from them the mechanics of the charitable deduction. They are generous to their core. They are generous souls. They made the gifts for all the right reasons. But let's talk to them about that tax incentive for charitable giving and why it's so important. I think we need to articulate that case for charitable giving. It can be refined from what I just said, but it's a pretty simple case. Mess with the charitable deduction. You're going to hurt the people who benefit from charitable organizations. And then finally, and this should not be difficult for us as fundraisers. We need to ask. We need to ask for their support. Please get in touch with your legislator and talk to him about how important the charitable deduction is. What's that? You made a campaign contribution to our representative? All the better. 
you have a louder voice than I do. Please get in touch with the representative and just, you're not going to get directly through to the representative. You'll talk to a legislative staffer, but make the case for tax incentives for charitable giving. So we have a few minutes left. Um, I think it is, I think we are headed for perilous times. And what I really worry about is with all the noise and everything else that's going on out there, this is going to get lost. People are going to forget about tax incentives for charitable giving, and then it'll be too late. What questions do you have? Yes? Yeah, good point. So the first point is there's a lot of us who work for nonprofits. That's sort of, and you're right, that's a constituency we should not ignore. A great number of our fellow employees do not itemize, but they could be mobilized to speak in favor of the charitable deduction. And then I love the second point. A majority of Americans have been, have been convinced that the estate tax, the death tax, is evil and should be done away with. Does anybody know what percentage of estates it applies to? Currently less than 1%. And yet Americans are convinced that the estate tax is the greatest evil to have ever happened. So we should be able to, I think you're right, we should be able to cross this bridge um, with, a certain, uh, with a certain amount of truth to it, I think. Good points. Yes, Bill. Yeah, it's a good point. Phil's question is, is the charitable sector spending enough for advocacy? Um, my answer is no. You can always spend more. We will never be able to compete, for example, with the life insurance industry or any of the industries that have billions of dollars to spend. I think the bigger challenge for the charitable sector is to figure out how to speak with one voice. And it's just not our nature. So, you know, we have the Council on Foundations. They're very concerned about the excise tax on private foundations. It's an important issue. But it's not the only issue, but in their world, it's kind of the only issue. The National Association of Charitable Gift Planners would be outraged about that law in California about the minimum remainder, but that's not the only issue. So we do, because of our nature, we have a hard time speaking with one voice, and I think that's been, that's been our biggest um, obstacle. That's been the biggest hurdle. We trip over our, each other. Um, I'm not sure that we need an entity. Actually, the National Association of Charitable Gift Planners has been part of a consortium for five or six years now that is at least, at least beginning to coordinate messages. So I, I think we're making progress, but it's just our nature. We're a collection of individualistic organizations, and it's difficult for us to agree on, on one point of view. I'm hopeful that Preserving the tax incentives for charitable giving can be that one unifying cause that we need. 